I would like to introduce to you John Button from the, uh, from, from, sorry, from Gartner. Um, he's the Principal Enterprise Risk Advisor at Gartner, and he's going to be leading our talk today about industry insights as it relates to viewing and managing cyber risk as an enterprise risk. And we've talked about that over the last several days, or la the last day and a half of not being just a technical issue, but as an enterprise issue. So. Welcome with me, John Button from Gartner. All right. Thank you very much. Check, check, check. Let's see. Can you guys hear me? No? Check, check, check. Is that better? Awesome. Okay. This thing's in my face. Here we go. So part of security. I have to log back into my computer. So talk about business enablement. Beautiful. So I will try not to stick to my notes too much. Um, I, I, I'm a little split screen right now. For any, anybody who's from Florida, uh, I'm from the Fort Myers area. So like as we're speaking, there's a nice big hurricane that's uh, going to be turning my fence into something else. So we shall see what happens. But, so needless to say, I'll try not to stick to this too much. And my other goal for the uh, talk today is I, I recognize that for many of you, I hope this isn't too re repetitive. So I hopefully I'm bringing some new insights and value to the conversation. Um, just by way of introduction again, my name is John Button. I am an enterprise risk management advisor with Gartner. And uh, I spend most of my time working with uh, risk practitioners for enterprise risk as well as CROs, helping them get their arms around their biggest challenges and how to make sense of all of this to the business. I've been involved in risk management for, I don't know, my whole career so far, so it's over a decade at the moment, um, either as a practitioner or a consultant, so I've been on both sides of the fence, and I, I like to try to bring that insight with me as well when I'm uh, entering these kinds of conversations and discussions. And my real passion is actually the philosophy of risk, and there's not enough uh, work on that, so that'll be, that's my project if I ever end up having time. So in any case, um, Needless to say, uh, the ambition for today's uh, presentation is going to be focused on getting a better understanding of the cyber risk landscape and also the broader kind of economic context that we're, we have this in, as well as what are the perceptions right now of enterprise cyber risk management within the organization. And then lastly, are there any things we can do moving forward uh, in terms of working together to do that from an ERM and a cyber risk management perspective? So. I've never tried this before, so this is fun. Let's see. Click. All right. So that's essentially the roadmap for today. Like any good risk management process, we're going to start with the context. Uh, then we're going to talk about those perceptions. And then, like I said, the way forward. Excellent. Cool. Very simple graphic. Um, essentially, what we have here is on the left-hand side, the yellow, global economic uncertainty. I don't think anybody's too unfamiliar with that. Go check your Robinhood app and see where stocks are. I know I did just like about an hour ago and I went, oh my God. Um, we have inflation, we have talent shortages and these kinds of things. A lot of these were spurned on by the COVID-19 pandemic and we haven't really come back from that yet. So that's the global economic uncertainty side. It's persistent, it's hanging around, it's not going anywhere yet. On the right hand side, Excuse me, left-hand side. It's reverse for you folks. For the left-hand side, next wave of digital uh, expansion is, is a, what I'm calling it. Um, this was also spurned on by COVID-19. And uh, essentially, businesses, in order to try to survive and thrive, they had to you know, change their ways. And they turned to digitalization to do that. So let me dive into that just a little bit more. Excellent. Uh, Gartner does a lot of studies. I chose just three different uh, particular facts that help us from, from the recent survey we did with CEOs and also boards of directors to help kind of paint the picture a little bit as it relates to this um, acceleration of, of digitalization. So um, almost every organization has now some kind of digital strategy effort. And by way of example, 69% uh, of boards of directors cite acceleration of digital initiatives as one of the impacts of COVID-19. 
No surprise there. 64% of organizations, so the middle, are accelerating their digital investments. These include investments in innovation and modernizing their legacy systems and applications, as well as uh, changing how uh, customers, uh, customer interactions occur. Um, and then lastly, for CEOs, 83% of CEOs are looking to increase their investment in digital capabilities. This came from our 2022 studies uh, for both boards of directors and CEOs, but um, some of the new 2023 material just came out, and it's, I, I don't want to say it's verbatim, so you should still go read it, but it's extremely similar. And kind of like with, you know, was it Spider-Man, I think it was, like with great, with great power comes great responsibility. So with great technology ambition comes a ton of risk. So for, again, for a lot of you, uh, part of this presentation was for ERM folks. For, so for ERM, this is shocking. For you all, this might be been there, done that. But the information in front of you comes from the uh, Verizon's 2022 uh, data breach report. And it's the average cost of the uh, breaches by initial attack vector. Now, they actually did the, the breaches, uh, the average cost and the average frequency. So this is just the cost because it made the graphic simpler. But essentially, if we look at the very left-hand side, the green, we have at the very lowest end of the scale, it's accidental data and device loss. So that was the lowest at 3.94 million. And then when we go to the very other side of the scale by the initial attack vector uh, that created the breach, we have uh, phishing at 4.91 million. And for the frequency, I just simply chose the top three and I highlighted them, and uh, there's a little asterisk there. Um, so stolen or compromised credentials. So that is the middle of the highlighted ones. Uh, that was the primary attack vector in 19% of the breaches. Phishing was the second most common in 16%, and cloud misconfiguration was third um, at 15% in terms of frequency. So in any case, the natural question is what exactly is all driving this. Um, and like I said, I want to go relatively fast. I have a lot of things to cover, and, but I also don't want to lose you folks. So the global attack surface, if you're going to talk about uh, risk drivers for cybersecurity risk, I think you have to at least start here. Um, <clears throat> now, we don't just measure it now by the, you know, it's not by the, the month or the week or even the hour. <clears throat> To actually make these numbers meaningful, we're actually measuring it by the minute. And so in this case, just by way of example, 117,289 hosts are created each minute, 613 domains created each minute, 700, or 375 new threats each minute. Um, what's, kind of, what's the creation behind this? Uh, I really like Doug Hubbard's book, uh, the what is it, how to measure anything in cybersecurity, and he kind of boils it down to really uh, four main areas. There's increasing persons on the internet, so the number of folks actually on the internet, now it's about five billion. Each user spends more time online, and that's partly driven by the pandemic. Um, and that's also, we get more services and products online as well now. Vulnerabilities continue to increase, and lastly, organizations are very closely networked to one another. So we're only just one or two degrees apart. <clears throat> um, uh, Microsoft did a study in 2022. They released it in April. And I just took a little snippet of it. But again, back to the kind of 60 second window, anything can happen. And, and by the way, for anybody, again, these are leave behind. So when you download the slides, you can also dig in deeper if, if you can't read what's, what's on there. I don't want to go through all of it, but essentially, a lot of really bad things are happening in every 60 seconds. Um, password attacks, 34,740. IoT-based attacks, uh, almost 2,000 per minute. Uh, so what that really means is by the end of my presentation, in the next 45 minutes, there's going to be 1.5 million password attacks, and IoT-based, 85,000, so on and so forth. So obviously, really bad stuff. Maybe if I end sooner, maybe there'll be less. What do you think? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and.
And here we go. So let's get to the new risk drivers. OK. What you see on the screen oh, I said that's my computer. Well, what you see on the screen here is uh, I've labeled these. I gave myself permission to call them this. You have the old faithful drivers. And these are the things that I've seen for the last few years um, when folks are talking about like risk drivers behind great big cyber risk. Um, third party vulnerabilities. We estimated at Gartner, I believe it's, uh, we think enterprises have somewhere between like 3,000 uh, additional uh, entities they're connected to outside of the, their initial uh, enterprise, so the extended, the extended enterprise. Um, obviously, that relates also to the third down growing attack surface. I've kind of covered that. Um, threat sophistication, they're using new technologies, AI and things like that. But also, there's just like this natural kind of vicious cycle. You folks, they, there's an attack, we put up some defenses, they adjust, they evolve their attack patterns or how they do it. We evolve our defenses. It's a vicious cycle and we're always kind of playing catch up. And then insecure behavior from the, at the very, very bottom on the, again, we're on the right hand side. Um, uh, the 2022 Verizon data breach report said that 86% of breaches in 2021 involve the human elements. So that means me and you. So we're to be thanked for that. If we move over to the other side, so I, I'm actually not even sure how to direct everybody to the left or the right. Anyway, to the yellow side for the new risk drivers. And I think this is actually where it gets interesting. So let me make sure I don't go too off course here. For the first one, at the very, very top, uh, increasing risk appetite. So this data comes from our 2022 Board of Directors uh, survey. We were asking questions around their uh, enterprise investment priorities and approaches. So one of the key findings was that 57% of boards of directors have increased or expect to increase their appetite in 2022. And in the same study, 58% of them ranked digital technology initiatives as their top business priority. In other words, boards recognize that to compete in this market, they're going to have to make these big technology bets. And they, uh, and they're, they realize they're going to have to take the risks that go along with it. So as the, you know, late, great Stephen Covey said, when you pick up one end of the stick, you pick up the other. And I think they, they seem to kind of get that. For the second relatively new risk driver, um, and again, I think I heard in another presentation, it's like, wow, we've heard this before. And again, for ERM folks, this is brand new, so hopefully this isn't too old. Um, uh, the, there's a cybersecurity talent shortage. Um, so I, there's a lot of actually sources I could have gone to. I chose the uh, ISC squared 2021 cybersecurity workforce study. And just two little things I took out of it, um, even though we had 700, thousand new cybersecurity professionals enter the workforce in 2020. Um, we are still, uh, we still need to grow by about 65% in order to be able to protect the assets of an enterprise. So there's like a long way to go there. When they asked the folks participating in that study, what, what, what are the top five skills that you would want to improve or you feel like we don't have enough of? Guess what? The number one one was risk assessment, analysis, and management. So they need help there. And I thought this is funny. Um, according to a Gartner survey, 78% uh, of CISOs cite lack of competent staff as the most likely reason their company would experience a data breach. Now, the reason I thought that was funny is because if I was a cybersecurity professional and in this room, I'd be wondering, did my boss just participate in that study? I want to know the answer to that question. All right. Uh, the new risk driver three, shifting investments. All right, bear with me. This one's a little uh, multifaceted, okay? <clears throat> so recall that one of the number one bets for boards and CEOs right now is digital technology initiatives. Okay, so from the same studies I've been citing so far from, from Gartner, our 2022 studies, we asked them how capital allocation, capital allocation would change to accommodate digital investments. This is more bad news for you folks. 
40% of enterprises are moving funding for digital business into business units and not IT. So that's one fact. Let's just put a pin in that. According to our benchmark data for IT security spending in 2022, uh, when we look at the, the percent of security spending as a percentage of revenue, it's been flat for the last uh, four years, I believe, four or five years. And it actually may even go down because revenues have gone up dramatically, I believe, this year. <clears throat> so that's not good. Gartner projections for 2023 are that cybersecurity will go down. So there's no, uh, there's no silver lining to this yet. So, that, <laughs> so, 40, so in summary, the technology spending these big risky bets, the money for that's not going to IT. It's going to non-technology experts. The cybersecurity spending has been flat and is predicted to go down. So, you know, that could result in, uh, obviously, some in, 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 inadequate protection. So, again, potential risk driver there. And then lastly, distributed decisions. And I kind of call this uh, sanctioned and un unsanctioned decision making. Just like we had with uh, sanctioned IT and unsanctioned IT, or shadow IT. There's this new phenomenon right now, and we have uh, several studies that really go through this, but essentially, in a nutshell, there's a greater number and variety of risk decisions being made by more people across the enterprise with a greater or a growing percentage of them being outside of IT. All right, I'll say that one more time. A greater number and variety of risk decisions in the enterprise being made by more people across the enterprise with a growing uh, number of them being outside of IT. And so this is essentially kind of a risk governance nightmare. And you know, lo and behold, when we asked CISOs in the same study, 92% uh, of them believed that there's a negative impact when business decisions are, make, uh, are made uh, without essentially their involvement. Hopefully there's no surprise for that. OK. So these are some of the old faithful risk drivers and some of the new ones that are really driving driving this. Let's move on to perceptions of enterprise uh, cyber risk. So these are the perceptions within the enterprise. Excuse me. OK. As a part of the same 2022 board of directors study, cyber risk is now viewed overwhelmingly or most folks view this as a business risk, cybersecurity as a business risk. 88% of respondents say this. They say it's a business risk, not a technology risk. And that's a 30% increase when we ask the same question in 2016. So this upward shift is uh, picking up steam. All right. And Cyber risk, given everything we've talked about with the digital initiatives and all this, it, it's clearly not just about information anymore. Um, it's really like any other enterprise risk at this point. Um, its impact can be felt across the entire uh, risk universe of the enterprise. And so the point of the graphic is really just to show we, have the, maybe we, we may have this discrete event, but its impact, impact can trigger a number of other areas, or it could trigger another other, or impact another, any other number of business functions, whether it be strategic, financial, operational, or whatever. And so this is uh, especially true now, given that IT is the foundation of all these new business uh, initiatives. But there's an example. I, I just was working with a client, I, it was like six or seven months ago, and it was a good example, so I made sure I wanted to make sure I mentioned it for this talk. Um, they were actually being acquired. So they're in the middle of a very strategic activity, essentially a merger and acquisition. Uh, they were being acquired. And if you're an ERM, you're doing kind of double duty. So you've got your day job, and then you're trying to make sure things are going OK for the, for the merger and acquisition. Somewhere along the process, they actually were, they had a breach. Now, you have the operational impact of that. And I'm sure there's some financial impacts to that as well. But most importantly, that almost, it actually put the, uh, the merger and acquisition into jeopardy. 
And um, so that's kind of the reality. And that's, you know, there's a million examples like that, but that's just one. So this is a big deal now. And just by way of another example, and some of you are probably already aware of this, but it, it's, uh, it was news for me. Excuse me. Um, you know, board view, the board's view, cyber risk is a business risk, as well they should, because now there's no place to hide if this thing goes through. Um, there's cybersecurity regulations all over the world. Uh, I have a few on there on the actual map, but the one I actually wanted to focus on for this particular slide is the uh, NYDFS um, uh, new proposals that they're putting out. And for those of you who don't know, the NYDFS cybersecurity relation, uh, regulation, it basically is for insurance companies and financial institutions who are doing business in New York, and they basically have to assess their cybersecurity risk profile. But there were, there were of the several provisions that are being put up, and again, it's actually, I think, happening right now, so some of you may know better than I do, but there were, there were three in particular that I thought were kind of in interesting. So it may be hard for you, to, you folks to see. Um, one of them, for example, is a 72-hour notice of ransomware events. So if you have a significant enough breach, you have to alert it. Again, there's the impact of the breach itself, but what does that do for the organization's reputation now that it has to go public? like immediate or within 72 hours. So something to think about. And these are things that ERM is totally invested in. This is part of why they exist. This has really caught my attention. CEO certification. I'd never heard of that before. So basically, the CEO has to basically co-sign co uh, that they're being compliant. So now there's really nowhere to hide for whoever the CEO is. Um, and again, you could ask, again, how would this impact other areas in the business? Well, again, there's a compliance aspect to it, but there's also maybe we have to extend our uh, director and officer insurance, DNO insurance, to maybe the CISO, who's not normally considered a part of the C-suite, or may, sometimes it's not at least. So again, far-reaching implications. And then lastly, executive management involvement. So the board must delegate the, the development, implementation, and maintenance of the InfoSec program to the executive management or its delegates. So now they're really asking, have we fully integrated? You know, it's like, we need everyone's attention. Is this actually getting done? You know, so this is gonna be a game changer if this goes through, and some of you may know if it actually has or not. But I, like I said, I think it's actually like recent. I think it's this week or last week or something. Okay, let's move forward. Okay. So now we got all these pieces we're trying to put together between the risk drivers, the characteristics of the context right now, what's going on in, in, in enterprises, outside of enterprises. Um, for example, there's the, on the very, the very middle blue one, enterprise digital sprawl. I made that up. That actually, I made that word up. That doesn't exist. Uh, or the phrase, rather. It's because I didn't want to create additional pieces because I had to put my kids to bed. And I thought, this is taking forever. I'm just going to make up a word. But here's what I meant by it. Just by way of example, uh, digital sprawl. So we got the investments we talked about kind of going everywhere, you know, except for cybersecurity, apparently. Um, data sprawl, people replicating data, creating data, you know, who's really managing all this. Anyway, that's going crazy. We've got decision sprawl, all these distributed decisions where everyone's kind of a king for a day when it comes to technology. Um, and in this technology sprawl, uh, again, age-old shadow IT, or even if it's sanctioned, you know, are we governing this correctly? So that's just one example, but all of these things, we're trying to put these pieces together. But you cannot finish a puzzle if you don't have all the pieces, and we have a problem, given everything we've talked about. <clears throat> and I tried to, I'm trying to summarize it a little bit. So for, uh, when I say SRM in there, it's, a, it's kind of a Gartner term. They say security risk management or security and risk management. It really is like the IT risk folks. But in any case, the IT risk team and CISOs. Limited line of sight across the entire risk portfolio. You know, they're focused on their function. They're focused on cyber risk. We've talked about some of the ways that cyber risk is like a pinball, just bing, bing, bing. It just goes everywhere, you know? Um, they don't necessarily have the line of sight for, for the rest of the portfolio for the enterprise. 
resource limitations, and risk process skills. Um, less funding, challenges with, uh, with risk process um, knowledge and expertise, et cetera. And then very equally important, I suppose I almost said more importantly, but you know, potential strategic misalignment. So CISOs and their IT teams, they might be, and I, I, I hear this a lot personally, which is they tend to be very tactical. They have a hard time connecting what they're doing to the business or to the strategic goals and objectives. Or maybe they are aligned, but they aren't really good at articulating it. So these are some of the challenges, in summary, I, I should say. So anyway, we'll put a pin in that. We'll come back to it. <clears throat> so we have some good news and some bad news. So let's start with the good news. And it might be good news for me, maybe, more, because uh, this could be job security. Um, boards view ERM as the way forward. So again, same study. We say, what are you going to do about these risks? What's your approach? Now, there's a whole list of them there. Don't get lost in all the numbers. Um, but actually, each and every activity on there, ERM is usually somehow directly related to or is doing something. But the top two really caught my attention. So they happen to be the top two. And um, it really, I think, says something. So the very, very top one. 72% of boards of directors are aligning risk, strategy, and performance to drive business resilience. That right there, that is essentially ERM's value proposition. That's the desired state. That's what they're there for. So that's interesting. The one below that, 45% are investing more resources in overall enterprise risk management processes. So ERM is going to get a, a, a check to help make, uh, hopefully, some of this go away and help manage this. So that's the good news. Here's the bad news, if I haven't given you enough already. <clears throat> the figures in front of you come from our 2022 um, audit risk and priority uh, survey. Now, ERM is not audit, but they are an excellent proxy for trying to understand, if you don't have the data on, on ERM, what ERM's sentiments are. Uh, right now, they, for the clients that I work with, they tend to kind of go hand in hand. <clears throat> Ransomware and cyber vulnerability were ranked as the highest importance. And at the same time, they had the lowest confidence in. So there's agreement. It's incredibly important. And we have no confidence or very low confidence in our ability to uh, manage that, measure it, whatever. Audit's not managing it per se, but same idea. We, we don't have the, as it relates to technology risk, it scares us. And this is really important because <clears throat> the biggest risk area that the board obviously is leaning on ERM to take care of is like the one area that they would go, I don't even know what we're talking about. This is scary. <laughs> so <clears throat> keep that in mind. And click, please. Beautiful. <clears throat> so uh, I think we found the missing piece. Uh, <clears throat> let me start at the bottom, and I'll work my way up. The strategic misalignment. If there's challenges that CISOs and, IT, and or IT risk teams are too tactical, ERM is the opposite. They're strategic. They're supposed to be strategic. In fact, this is the trade-off. They can speak the tactical language. ERM can speak the strategic language. That's the only language they speak, actually. The one language that executives speak in, which is goals and objectives. That's their main focus. So there's help there. <clears throat> Go up the next rung of the ladder. <clears throat> ERM are getting more resources and experts, in the, and they're also, sorry, ERM's getting more resources, and they're also meant to be risk ex experts. They don't own any risk, but they are experts in the process. That's, these are some of the areas that the CISOs were, or CISOs were struggling with, resource limitations and risk, uh, risk process skills. Again, a nice little continuity there. And then ERM, they have a, again, 
by the very nature of, the, of uh, where they sit within the organization, unique enterprise-wide vantage point. So they can help compensate for that. Whereas again, the SRM teams don't have that. <clears throat> and just to make the point a little bit further, excuse me, my voice is a little dry. <clears throat> Gartner also conducted a study on CISO effectiveness. And there was one part of it that I kind of stole because it helps kind of make the point. Um, basically, put simply, the most effective CISOs, according to the study, they prioritize non-IT relationships. And so we have these kind of orbits here. It's actually, it's hard to see the widest one. There actually is a line there. I can see it on mine, but I don't know if I can see it on that. Uh, needless to say, um, the, the table stakes obviously was IT, but it was really what they were doing with the non-IT folks. And obviously what's, based on just the last slide I had, I mean, ERM, this is ERM's playground, the area that most CISOs are trying to get to to up their game, not just speak value, but trying to actually align themselves to the, to the organizational goals and objectives. And that's where ERM plays. That's where they live. And not just that, when they actually looked at what exactly the top performer, the, the most effective CISOs were doing in terms of behaviors, what made them differentiators, um, almost 90% were basically doing the following. They were keeping decision makers aware of current and emerging enterprise risk. They were focused on horizon scanning to stay ahead of emerging threats and also possibly looking for new technologies. And 66% were focused on collaborating with senior business decision makers to define risk appetite. Emerging risk, horizon scanning, risk appetite, these are the sweet spots of ERM. So it's no coincidence to me that the top performers were doing activities that actually are within the purview of exactly what ERM is doing. So something to keep in mind, you've got a friend in a high place, you may wanna leverage that if you can. Okay, and hopefully we're doing okay on time. So the way forward, uh, very simply, um, very simply, we need a enterprise cyber risk management kind of strategy. And there's a simple little definition there, an integrated, thorough, and strategic approach to the measurement and management of information systems and assets, asset risk uh, across the entire enterprise. The key, though, is the integrated part. That's actually the key to making that work. <clears throat> what you see in front of you here is the a customizable RACI chart. This comes from our what we call our Risk Accelerator Guide. And this is meant to list out the roles and responsibilities broadly that we feel ERM practitioners, uh, it's, it's for ERM, but it's meant to kind of start to lay out the roles and responsibilities. So what I'd like to do is let me just zoom in or zone in on, yeah, you still can't see it, that's a bummer. Um, I was gonna focus on just the ERM heads. The three areas that they're actually primary, primarily concerned on fall within risk governance, risk evaluation, and within risk governance, there's two objectives they're trying to meet. Uh, common risk view and integrating with ERM, and then on the risk evaluation side, the one place where, again, ERM is playing, according to our research, is really in analyzing risk. So what I'd like to do and these are basically, basically, these are the touch points. This is, these are the sockets that, not ERM, ERM is not gonna be plugging into the cybersecurity team, the cybersecurity team is gonna be plugging into ERM. And so these, these are the touch points, these are the areas that we're gonna wanna focus on. Because what we're not doing is it's not like playing catch or something like, actually, I'll get back to that in a second. So let me just move forward for the sake of time, actually. And next, please, yeah, awesome. So the common risk view, part of that, um, the deliverable might be like the risk profile, but, but 
part of the spirit of what that's getting after is ensuring, again, common risk, risk view, ensuring that everybody in the organization, when they're, when, when they're doing their risk management, risk management activities, they have a clear understanding um, of the risk appetite, or in this case, cyber risk appetite, tolerance, and capacity. And what you see in front of you is an example of basically the components of a risk appetite framework. It's, a, it's essentially like a risk, it's a strategy for trying to achieve, um, it's, a, it's your strategic approach to essentially trying to achieve uh, um, risk appetite. Um, now recall that 75% of boards are focused on aligning risk strategy and performance to drive business resilience. That was like the number one thing that they were going to do. And what you see in front of you is literally the vehicle to doing that. And when it's done correctly, you get these other kind of tangential benefits as well. Because as I like to say, it really, the risk appetite framework ends up becoming the connective tissue between the risk governance and your risk culture. So you're killing several, several birds with one stone. Although I don't advocate killing birds with stones. <laughs> and by the way, a lot of folks ask me, and I wouldn't be able to talk about it here, but a lot of folks actually ask me, especially ER, obviously ER, ERM teams, I want to get to strategic risk management. It's like, that's like the Graceland for them, because they're kind of kept out of the really the good strategy stuff. And I say, this is the key. You want to get there? That's how you do it. Start with this. This is one of the most strategic activities you can be involved in. And that's true for ERM, and that's true for cybersecurity leaders as well. All right, next slide. <clears throat> fully integrate, uh, the objective was fully, uh, to fully integrate CRM. So integrate your cyber risk management with ERM. Uh, what you see in front of you is a rendition. Um, I took the liberty, basically, in NIST, the NIST IR8286. It's actually, I think, a really good document. I encourage everyone to take a look at it. I believe parts of it are in draft form right now. Um, they have a, like a six-phase process. I really just wanted to bring it down to kind of four. And I use the puzzle pieces um, because actually is, it's kind of a great analogy because this is not, this is what I was going to say earlier, this is not us playing catch. So ERM does this up here, and I'm going to throw the ball to you, you do your thing. This is actually, we're going to be between steps one and two, and then three and four, especially three and four, they should be tightly integrated. And a better analogy would be like a relay race. Um, you need some kind of a strategy, some kind of a way to do that. You have to figure out what your processes are right now, and then, and then where are the touch points, and then how can we do something around that. And this is one example, so I just put it simply into uh, four, and how do we get this kind of cyber risk portfolio roll up from at least a process standpoint. Um, so, moving on. And then, of course, we were focused on, or ERM is interested, or most, mostly participates on that analyzing risk phase. Sometimes we're providing models, cyber risk models or, models or something like that. But essentially, we have to figure out a way to get from the bottom to the top. And uh, to do that, you're going to need some kind of a enterprise cyber risk model to get there. Now, um, Gartner doesn't have any specific guidance, or they don't actually, um, what's the word for it? Uh, yeah, subscribe to a particular model or standard or anything like this. But being a FAIR conference, this is actually absolutely appropriate and perfect. So in the middle, we have the ISO 31000. A lot of the clients I work with, that's the uh, part of the framework or the standard they've used to help shape their ERM program. And those are intentionally broad in order to allow, it's like a big house, you know, and it's intentionally broad so that we're able to begin to fit and architect the more specific needs of the organization when we start getting down lower and lower. And so, for example, uh, the risk analysis phase, that's exactly, it's a nice little plug-in for where a cyber risk model goes. But then on the control analytics model, that's actually relatively new. And uh, as Jack had said yesterday, and he's absolutely right, especially when you get to the enterprise level, the key is that no control stands alone. And guess what? When you get to the enterprise level, 
The same is actually true on the risk side. No risk stands alone. We need a model to capture that. We have to model these things. Anyway, those would be two potential plugins in, in terms of how I see it. Somebody could maybe re-architect it so that it's not at risk evaluation, it's at risk treatment, whatever. <clears throat> but it fits really nicely, and it's a great example. Okay, and this will be the, the last slide. Um, we talk about this kind of inter enterprise portfolio view. This would be a great activity to also bring together the CRM team, again, who has the knowledge and expertise, and the ER ERM team who has the knowledge of the risk process, and they're trying to manage this portfolio. And what you see in front of you is, it's an actual attempt at doing what I call just a preliminary risk interdepend interdependency modeling. It's, it's kind of back of the napkin. It's rough, it's manual. This is not automated, it's not sexy or anything like that. But what it is though, is it's an initial attempt at understanding what are the relationships among these different broader kind of enterprise risk, or what honestly a lot of folks on the ERM side would call risk. And anybody here, we'd say, well that's not a risk, that's a concern or that's a condition or something. But needless to say, what are the, how do they interact? What's going on there? If inflation goes up, so does cyber insurance. That's a big deal. But then what does that do for your cybersecurity budget? Right? You start to put these pieces together. The idea behind this actually came from an early case study we had from Lockheed Martin where they used bow tie uh, diagrams to do this. Um, but for the sake of the presentation, I, I want to keep it at least a little simpler. And the goal of something like this, and we have an, a risk interdependency tool, but essentially the idea is if you want to be able to measure, or at least have an initial guess at which of these items on there, which of these nodes, are doing more pushing against other risk areas, and which ones are being pushed more. And maybe there's a bully that's doing all the pushing and, you know, or something like that. So we want to know where that is. And then we want to be able to do, what is the critical path? We call it the critical path. Which of those could create like a cascading effect? And so the idea behind it on the, right, the left-hand side, right-hand side on the side, um, <clears throat> is that you try to find out where's, where, where's a critical path of a very serious interaction between several different risks, and then what's something that we could do to basically disrupt that. And so in this case, as a very simple example, you know, maybe you, uh, between the cybersecurity budget and the cyber talent risk that we have, we can't afford the new guys, they're too expensive. Well, maybe we need to, you know, reevaluate our contracts, um, you know, get some low-hanging fruit there, renegotiate, get better terms and conditions, and take those savings and maybe reinvest it into either security awareness training or new folks who are gonna be uh, uh, the more expensive cyber talent that we need, something like that. Maybe that'll help disrupt and reduce some of the risk that we have there. So just in terms of key takeaways, cyber risk now requires an, an, an enterprise-wide response. Uh, I encourage uh, cybersecurity leaders to start working with ERM as soon as possible if you have an ERM team. Um, and really develop that unified strategy. And I, I would not wait for them to come to you. I would go to them. They're your best friends. They're already up there. They're asking for help. They're like Jerry Maguire. It's like, help me help you. And you know, they want your help. So go help them. And it, I think it'll pay dividends. Um, obviously, adopt an enterprise model. Measurement's one of the most critical things. It's on ERM's to-do list. And it's going to be also on, uh, obviously, any cybersecurity to-do list. And then lastly, like I said, friends in high places, leverage those relationships, and that will, even if you're already a differentiator, by leveraging those relationships with ERM, you're already able to increase at least the perceived value that you have as a CISO. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. No? All right, well, thank you very much. Yeah.